All right, we're back for more lecture. So keep in mind, I am finishing up my intro to diabetes lecture. So this is actually a full lecture. This is not the short, sweet, simple version. There are other short, sweet, simple videos. Keep searching through or look under unit one, um, the diabetes respiratory videos to see more. Um, the more like basic ones, they're just gonna have a summary where I'm going more in depth. So this is to for those people that want or need more details. So when we last left off, we had talked about teaching and things that were needed for diabetes. And now we're starting to go into what happens when there's highs and lows in diabetes. So first we're gonna talk about um, low blood glucose. Um, and most people would think that we were much more when it's high because I talk about all these complications that can happen when it gets too high, but there's actually so much scary stuff that can happen when it gets low, like coma and death. So <laughs> low blood glucose is um, super scary. And usually the threshold there, what I'm looking at when I'm worried about a low blood glucose, um, you know, the normal we said is like 70 to 100. So when it gets less than 70, it is considered hypoglycemia. Um, but everyone has a different threshold. Some people they're at like they're at, in the 70s and they're already starting to feel it. Whereas other people, um, they're at 30 and you're like, wait, how are you still awake? <laughs> and so um, it just kind of depends on the patient. Um, so what you need to know is the nurse is first, what's going to cause it? You need to know who's at risk because um, you need to kind of be thinking about what factors are like, hey, if I take this action, it could put them at risk for hypoglycemia. So things you should consider is if they've had too little food. So if you have a patient who's not eating very much, you're going to be more concerned about their blood glucose being low. Um, having too much medicine, if they get started on new medications, a variety of insulins, a mix of insulin and orals, and they've never done that before, or, um, you know, anything that might be, you know, like a higher dose of medicine, um, we're going to be worried about that. That's why, you know, medication safety around insulin is so key and insulin is a two nurse checkoff at most hospitals. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the fun med section. Um, there's also, um, if there's a food medication mismatch. And what I mean by that is, is that the patient gets um, their medication, but then doesn't get food in the time that they need in order to cover that medication that they just took. In other words, all medications for diabetes are going to decrease their blood glucose. That's the point of it is, is that they're going to have a more of that euglycemia or that stable blood glucose. Um, but if I'm not feeding the patient to match the medications I'm giving them, um, then there can be a problem. Um, incorrect administration. So um, for example, insulin is supposed to be given subcutaneously. If I give it intravenously, it's going to have a lot bigger effect on that patient. So if it's administered incorrectly, or if I administer it in a muscle that's more vascular versus the sub tissue, it can be absorbed quicker or differently. Um, too much exercise without food. We talked in the last video about how if I'm exercising like crazy, like just working out like nuts, um, that then their patient's going to be, I'm not, I don't even say, I shouldn't even say that it has to be nuts. Like if I'm working out, it's going to take my glucose because I need energy in order to complete those activities. So anytime there's too much exercise and they don't eat before, which is why it's so key to eat before exercising. And then also too much alcohol without food. Now, everyone always thinks with alcohol, like, oh, your blood sugar goes up because you're drinking a margarita. It's got sugar in it. Um, but even if you're drinking sweet drinks, you can still get hypoglycemic. And I talked about this a little bit in the last video, but effectively what's happening is your liver gets so overwhelmed because it's focused on trying to get this toxin of alcohol out of your liver. It's like, I can't even deal, worry about glucose right now. So it stops releasing um, glucose, the stores that it normally would. So um, uh, these patients, when they drink, um, which they should moderate how much they drink, but when they do drink, they should eat some food with it. So what does this patient look like? So first, we need to know who's at risk. Now, what does it look like? So a patient that is hypoglycemic, you know, like kind of the, one of the catchphrases that people have said in the past is cold and clammy, give me candy. Um, so, I mean, it kind of, they have the um, acronym here of tired. So tachycardia, irritability, restless, excessive hunger, and diaphoresis or depression. So, um, you know, a lot of times people compare this to like someone who is, you um, we call they talk about someone who's drunk because they're very like lethargic, tired, irritable, hungry, stuff like that. Um, but you know, the way I kind of broke this down is they have signs of not enough sugar, like being tired and lethargic, like there's no sugar in my blood, uh, not in my blood, sorry. There, yeah, there's no sugar in my blood, but there's also no sugar in my cells. Um, so, um, you know, I'm going to be tired, lethargic. I'm going to be hungry because my cells are hungry because they don't have the glucose they need and irritable because I don't feel good because I need that sugar. 
So, um, and then there's also going to be signs of your fight or flight system being activated, and that's your sympathetic nervous system. And so the sweating and then the tachycardia. Now, really commonly people assume hypoglycemia, bradycardia, because they're like, everything slows down, but it's like your body doesn't have the energy to do what it needs to do, but then it's like, Hey, I'm, things aren't going well. I need to activate. So, you know, um, like, a, those funny TikToks where it talks about like, Holy spirit activate. That's kind of like what happens in hypoglycemia where, um, effectively what is going on is, is that your fight or flight gets activated and says, Hey, a bear's chasing me. Not really, but like, that's what it feels like. It's like, something's not working. I don't have sugar. I need to go into hyperdrive. So the body thinks, Hey, if I can pump faster, pump harder, um, then, um, I can get more glucose out to my cells. So it's trying to compensate for the lack of sugar, but um, it just leads you to this very, very uh, anxiety prone state. So then what are we gonna do about it? Um, so if they are, it's all about how awake they are. So if they are, um, so let me go into this for a second. Um, it, depending on how awake they are is how I'm going to treat them. So let's say that there's a question. It says the client is awake or conscious. Um, so that's what, um, you know, that's where you're going to kind of cue you in your head. Like, okay, this patient's awake. They can take something by mouth. I also have to know if they're in PO or not as well, because someone could be awake, but not allowed to take anything by mouth. So how I treat them depends on how awake they are. Um, and then also what their um, feed or oral status is, can they swallow? Um, and so uh, other things you might look for, like, is if the patient's talking to you, that means they're conscious or awake. Some of the students are like, well, it didn't say they were awake. And I'm like, but they're talking to you. So, you know, you have to kind of assume that they can. I know we always tell you don't assume in questions, but <laughs> I guess that's what time you have to. I know there's all like everyone hates the world of gray and nursing, but this is what it is. <laughs> so, um, and so, and, and keep in mind because of their symptoms, they may be drowsy, but they, um, you need to know how awake they are to determine treatment. Um, so if they're conscious and then again, the other caveat there is, and they can eat. Um, we're going to use what's called the rule of 15 or the 15 rule. And what we want to do is we want to give 15 grams of carbs and not just any carb. We want to give a fast acting carb. And that means something that is pure sugar right now. that's going to be absorbed immediately. So um, like this um, picture has, it's like half cup of fruit juice, regular soda, not diet soda, um, some hard candies or glucose tabs. Now, usually what we're going to do in the hospital is we're going to be going straight for that juice because it's going to be the quickest. Um, so um, we want, uh, we want to do some fast acting sugars. Um, but then, um, after 15 minutes, we're going to recheck their blood sugar. This is why it's called the rule of 15, 15 grams of carbs, wait 15 minutes, check the blood sugar again. If it's still low, another 15 grams of carbs, and then check again. Um, you're going to check it, um, at those regular intervals for a while. Now, once they stabilize, here's the thing is most people are like, okay, their blood sugar went up. They're good. Now there's something that drove their blood sugar down. Either they got too much insulin. They did not eat. Something happened. Something is not working. So we want to stabilize their blood glucose. So we're going to do that um, by giving carbohydrates plus protein or fat. Protein or fat helps you to absorb glucose over time in your intestines. So some examples of this is usually after we give them something like a turkey sandwich, peanut butter crackers, or cheese and crackers. That's going to have that that protein fat combo with the carbs that's going to help to keep their blood sugar up over time. Excuse me. All right. So let's say that they are unconscious or unable to take anything PO and PO means by mouth. Um, or let's say their blood glucose is just extremely low. And uh, on the test, we're not going to expect you to know like, hey, if their blood sugar is this, that's how low it is. Because every patient, again, is a little different. Um, but um, more just know it like more we focus on the are they unconscious or can they not take something by mouth? Um, if they have IV access, we're going to use what's called dextrose 50 or D50. And this is the most common thing used in the hospital. Um, is the, is the D50. I very, I, I don't know if maybe once I've ever given glucagon, um, because most patients have IV access and dex, D50 or dextrose 50 is what's usually readily available. It's an IV push. It's a big old syringe of, um, sugar. And, um, I'm going to give that per orders. Um, and everyone who's on insulin is automatically going to have orders for treatment for hypoglycemia in the hospital. Um, if they don't have IV access, I can do an IM injection, which is intramuscular injection of glucagon. Um, and this is also going to help as well to get their blood sugar up. But keep in mind, it's kind of what I said before. These are band-aids for a bigger problem. So we need to find out what the cause is. Some of these patients, like I'm treating their hypoglycemia, treating their hypoglycemia, and eventually they end up on a continuous sugar drip because I can't keep it up. So we always need to find the cause. So overall, the um, 
the other principle here um, to keep in mind if they're awake or not is if they're conscious, like let's say they're awake enough um, to, um, you know, tell me like, hey, I don't feel good. I'm sweating a lot. I'm really, I feel like my blood sugar might be low, whatever they're saying. Assess them first. And when I say assess them, I mean, check their blood glucose. So if they're conscious, we check a blood glucose first. And then if the hypoglycemia is present, then do the least invasive first. So again, if they can take orals, we're going to do the rule of 15. If they can't, then I will do the, um, or, uh, you know, I'll do the um, IV options or IM options. Then if they're unconscious, I'm not going to wait around. I'm not going to be like, hey, this patient's passed out, but here, go grab the glucometer for me. Um, like, no, I'm going to assume hypoglycemia in a patient that's diabetic, that is unconscious, unarousable, and then I'm going to treat them first. So if conscious, assess their blood sugar first, if unconscious, treat first, um, and then um, that should say hypoglycemia. I really messed up on this PowerPoint. And I went back in the first, after the first video and tried to find all the places. And I, I'm not going to watch my whole 57 minute video. I try to go back and watch to figure out those other typos that I have. And I cannot find them. And I watched for like 15, 20 minutes and scrolled through and I read through the PowerPoints. So um, my students are out of luck. Eventually I'll find all these and correct these errors. Anyway. So let's talk on the other end. So now let's talk about hyperglycemia. This is a high blood glucose. So a high blood glucose we worry about because it can progress to crisis. So when I'm talking about hyperglycemia, I'm not talking about crisis level yet. I'm not talking about DKA or HHNKS or HH, um, what is it? Hyperosmolar hyperglycemia. Yeah. Um, HHS, excuse me, there you go. It's not HHNKS or HHS. I'm just talking about someone has a high blood sugar. It's really important for you to know as the nurse what causes a high blood glucose because that's going to help you to uh, better, like, you know, know how to meet your patient's needs. Like it helps you kind of cue you in your head, oh, hey, this patient's probably going to be at risk for high blood glucose. So we've talked about this a lot in the first video, but anytime a patient is sick, they're going to be at higher risk for having hyperglycemia or high blood glucose. Um, so I should always assume if a patient's in the hospital, if their blood glucose is up, that's to be expected. It's not that I'm not going to treat it. I'm going to need to do something about it. Um, but I need to keep an eye on it, especially when they're sick. Because remember, you're producing more glucose to fight off whatever's going on. Um, being on steroids, and this is a big one. There's a lot of patients that are not diabetic that have to have their regular blood glucose checks and need insulin or other medications um, to help with their blood glucose um, because they're in the hospital and on steroids because steroids are used for a variety of conditions and um, can massively increase your blood glucose. Um, too much food. So on the other end, you know, not enough food for hypoglycemia, but for too much food um, can cause you, obviously, if I have too much food, I'm going to have more sugar, which can increase my blood glucose. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, not enough medicine. Maybe um, whatever doses I'm getting are not enough or not enough to meet the needs I have right now, because maybe I'm sick. Maybe I'm also on steroids. So maybe they're going to have to increase my doses. Um, inactivity. Um, so sedentary um, lifestyle can definitely increase your blood glucose. Um, how you manage your glucose, how your insulin is managed, um, stress itself, nursing school <laughs> should be on here, and then poor absorption of insulin. We'll talk about this when we get to the insulin section, talking about that. Um, but if I'm someone who is using the same injection site um, or you know um, not correctly administering that insulin in the right place um, and not absorbing it because it's not in the right place, then um, I can be at risk for having hyperglycemia because I'm just really not getting my medicine. Hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia can look similar, but you know, the difference there is, is there's the um, lack of the fight or flight um, that's going on when it comes to hyperglycemia. Um, so the, the big differences there are usually like, and again, like if it gets bad hyperglycemia, they're not in crisis yet. So usually they're not going to be profoundly dehydrated. They can have some signs of dehydration, but um, normally some of the big differences are you're going to really see that like that um, restless, irritable, sweating tachycardia is going to be seen, you know, that uh, with the hypoglycemia where with hyperglycemia really think um, this is going to look a lot like a patient that's coming in that has diabetes. They're going to have maybe some of those classic symptoms, the polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, peeing a lot, thirsty and hungry. Um, they can't have no symptoms because some people, they just live here. Um, but they also can have some signs of dehydration because the, the higher sugar is, if you remember, sugar um, leaches water from the cells. And because of that, you can have a dry mouth. And as it progresses to crisis, I'm not saying in hyperglycemia, they're gonna be hypotensive, but we can start to worry about that um, fluid loss as time goes on.
Um, when we're talking about hyperglycemia, I talked about it for hypoglycemia, um, but you know, I kind of gave you guys a little bit of a threshold in the last video that you know, no, very few patients are in that 70 to 100 range, like that nice, beautiful range. Um, we don't even start treating blood glucose till it's like above 150 uh, most of the time. And um, when it starts getting up to 180, 200, it's like, this is what we're talking about when we're saying hyperglycemia. It's higher than normal, but not crisis level. When we talk about DKA here in a minute, um, the threshold for that is greater than 250. But for some patients that are in HHS, like the threshold there can be like, 600, but keep in mind, like generally on most order sets in the hospital, when it's, when you get to like three or 400, it's saying, call the doctor, something's not right here. So think of hyperglycemia. And again, I'm not, this is not a set range. Do not hold me to this. You cannot bring back this video up um, as a, a test thing. I'm just giving you an idea, not a fixed rule, um, but kind of think in that range of like um, uh, 150 to 300 is in the kind of the hyperglycemia. Really 150 to 250 is really um, what we're talking about there. Cause once you're getting up above 250, that's getting pretty high and um, they can get into crisis depending on what type of diet diabetes they have. So how do we treat it? So it's a little bit more simple here. The big thing is, is that they need to take their medicine. We need to get them insulin or other medications, whatever they're prescribed. We're going to need to check their blood glucose more frequently, and they need to drink lots of fluids. If they can't take them orally, we may need to um, give them some, rehydrate them with IV fluids. So think of this is a lot of how we treated for sick day, the same kind of stuff, you know, drink more fluids, um, check your blood sugars more frequently, and then take your medicine as prescribed if it's appropriate. So let's talk about DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis now. And so now we're getting into crisis level. So we talked about before um, some of the causes of hyperglycemia. So um, a lot of the, like a lot of, and I'll, I'll talk about this on the next slide about some of the causes, but um, this is where things get really out of control to the point where I like my body is like, it gets out of that. Like, okay. Um, my blood sugar is high to, okay, this isn't working. My body's falling apart. <laughs> you know, like uh, it's kind of like when we get to that point where um, all of the things that your body's trying to do to help are not helping and they're just getting worse. So what happens here, and again, I'll talk about causes on the next slide. There's too much sugar and or not enough insulin. And this is um, diabetic ketoacidosis is more common in type one diabetics. It's possible for type two diabetics to get it. But really when you think diabetic ketoacidosis, it's really um, mostly associated with type one diabetics. Um, but again, sugar's in the blood, not in the cell and the body is hungry. And so eventually it gets to the point, if it is so hungry, it's been a while. Like a lot of times these patients, they're like, man, I haven't taken my insulin in a month. Um, the body gets hungry. And so eventually it stops looking for that glucose for energy and it starts breaking down fat. Um, as, as your body is breaking down fat, it seems like, oh, hey, great fix. I need like, you know, you might be thinking this is great. Remember people with type one don't have a lot of fat <laughs> usually to get it anyway, but um, it's breaking down this fat, but as it's breaking down this fat, there's a um, release of what are called ketones. In other words, a byproduct of breaking down fat for energy is going to be release of these ketones. Well, ketones, uh, you know, however, uh, you know, they may seem harmless. They are actually in acid. So um, in other words, I am breaking down fat for energy. I am building up these ketones as a result of breaking down that fat. And those ketones are acid. So I end up in what is called diabetic keto acidosis. You see how it all connects together. Um, and the three big problems here with diabetic ketoacidosis is one, severe dehydration um, because of, you know, it's the same thing with hyperglycemia where the um, sugar is leaching fluid from the cells. Two, they got a really high blood glucose. Sugar is not where it's supposed to be can lead to some problems. And then now they're also in an acid base imbalance acidosis. And if, um, have it um, by now. You should have learned about um, acidosis. Oh, excuse me, aunt. Um, but um, acidosis is um, when it comes down to it. We talked about with acid base that like anytime your um, pH is off, and these patients can come in with a super low pH. I'm talking about like 6.8, 6.9. Um, when your um, pH is off, everything in your body doesn't function uh, the right way. So causes, so most often nine times out of 10, people come in with this because they're newly diagnosed. They don't know they have type one diabetes um, or they stop taking their medicine. And this is so common because of the financial system and stuff, especially here in the United States. Um, insulin is 
crazy expensive. It's ridiculous how expensive it is. And so as a result of that, people can't afford their medications and they opt out to not take their medications because they cannot afford them. Um, or they also sometimes what happens, and I didn't bring this up in hyperglycemia, it could be another cause of that, is that they keep their insulin, they're only taking like a unit or two a day and then it expires, but they can't afford another vial. They don't want to waste it. So they're using expired insulin. And so it's, they're like, I'm taking my medicine, but it, it's expired. It's not working anymore. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, also commonly they stop taking their insulin when they're sick. Like we talked about on sick days, you're always still supposed to keep up with your insulin, but sometimes people will stop taking them and then they end up getting sick. Uh, well, sorry, they're sick already. So they have um, more glucose because they're sick and um, trying to fight whatever the infection or illness is. And then they don't take their medicine. It just gets way out of control, way out of hand. Um, and overall, like, you know, people that come in DK, usually they're not managing their diabetes well. And some people, you know, as sad as it is, they are like sometimes choosing drugs, um, and other things, um, alcohol use rather than, um, taking their, um, insulin or, you know, if they have to choose between one or the other, they choose the drugs. So what does this patient look like? So let's break down kind of what we talked about before with what they're going to have. So they're going to have signs of dehydration. Um, so that would be stuff like they're going to have dry um, mucous membranes. Um, that's going to be like in the mouth and stuff like that. They're going to complain of a dry mouth. They're going to have increased heart rate and decreased blood pressure. Now remember, this is the extreme. Remember I said really that increased heart rate is in the fight or flights, mostly with hypoglycemia. Well, that's a crisis. DKA is a crisis too. Um, cause they're so dehydrated that they're going almost into a state of like hypovolemic shock. Um, so heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes down. Um, and they may have some of these symptoms, they may have all of them. It just depends. Uh, they're going to have signs of hyperglycemia. They're going to be lethargic again because of lack of glucose where it needs to be. Um, and then all those classic symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia are really common too. And then we're going to look for signs of acidosis. And this is something that's specific to DKA. So they can have what's called Kuzmol's breathing, which I'll talk about in a second, and then acetone breath. So um, anytime your body has too much of something, it's going to try to get rid of it. If I have all these extra ketones, um, the body's going to start saying, Hey, I need to get rid of this. So one way it tries to get rid of them is literally through your breath. It literally is trying to blow off some of that acid. Um, so that smell, it's considered like a fruity breath. And some people will say it smells good. It sure don't. <laughs> so, um, but at the end of the day, um, uh, you, you definitely, you can, you can actually, it's a certain smell that you'll get to know, um, if you take care of a lot of patients with DKA. Um, so Kuzmol's respiration. So back in acid base, we talked about with a metabolic acidosis, which means I have too much acid, not enough base. Um, that's a kidney issue. So therefore, who's going to compensate? Excuse me, um, the lungs are going to compensate. So Kuzmol's respirations are actually a compensation for the metabolic acidosis, and it can be super helpful um, in patients that, you know, need this. Um, so um, uh, what do you call it? Um, as much as it seems like something you'll want to stop because it's going to sound like it's not helpful, it's actually helping to correct their acid base imbalance. So one of the best things I can do as the nurse for a patient with, who's having Kuzmol's respirations is set that head of the bed up and let them do them as long as they're not getting too overworked or, you know, having a decrease in oxygen saturations. So Kuzmol's respirations are a fast and deep um, respiration. So I'm breathing. <sighs> And so I'm taking a deep breath, but also breathing rapidly. And so that helps because um, remember, every time I exhale, I'm breathing off CO2, which is an acid. So if I have too much acid, the more I am exhaling, so that's the, why the rapid is important. And the deeper that I am, I am taking a breath, the more I'm able to get out. Um, so with Kuzmol's respirations, the point is, is to get more acid out um, in order to help to correct that pH imbalance. So it may look like they're breathing is not effective, but it's actually is helping to support them. And if they need supplemental oxygen or other things, you can give that to them as well. As uh, you know, we're going to talk about this here in a second, but I mean, the, like, I don't want them to Kuzmol's their way back into a normal pH because <laughs> that's not going to work. We've got to fix the problem, which, which goes back to them needing insulin. Um, but, um, this, I'm just saying that this is one way that the body does try to help and it can be helpful. I don't need to stop them or tell them stop breathing like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so diagnostic testing, um, they're going to have a glucose that's greater than or equal to 250. Um, that's the diagnostic criteria for part of the diagnostic criteria for DKA. 
when I check an ABG, because again, I need to look for the acidosis, I'm going to find a pH that is less than 7.3, sign of acidosis. Like I said, I've seen it all the way down to 6.7, 6.8, pretty low. Um, a bicarbonate, um, which is our base, it's going to be less than 16. That's a sign of acidosis. Um, and then looking in their urinalysis, I'm not only going to find a ton of glucose, because remember, the body's doing that process. I have too much glucose in my blood. Um, all that water gets pulled from the cell. It dilutes all that glucose, and then it shoves it right out in the urine because it's got too much fluid. So you're going to find a lot of glucose in the urine because I have too much where it's not supposed to be. And then also ketones, something else. The kidneys um, are like, hey, I've got too many ketones. I'm going to try to pee them out. So I'm, that's where I'm going to be looking for um, those things. So the treatment for DKA um, is really, like I said, about getting down to what's the problem. I'm going to do supportive things like monitor their neurological status because it can be altered. Um, head of bed elevated, like I said, to support a positive breathing pattern if they need oxygen. This is not an oxygen problem. They usually do not need oxygen, but if they do, we will give it as needed. But the real treatments come down to, I need to get my blood sugar lower. I need to correct the acidosis and fix the problem. And it really comes down to um, give fluids because fluids are going to dilute all that extra blood and rehydrate them. Because remember, these patients are in crisis. They can have those signs of hypovolemic shock. So I usually do fluids first is what I say. Um, and then um, the most important thing I can give is that insulin. The insulin is going to be what corrects the problem at the end of the day. Um, I can give fluids all day long. I can replace their electrolytes. I can support their Kuzmol's breathing, but until I give them what they're missing, they can't get better. So this is what students find confusing because they're like, okay, well, you're saying that fluids are first, but you're saying regular insulin is most important. So what answer do we give on the test? And um, I would never agree to a question that had both of these and said, which one do you do first? Because really you're doing them simultaneously. In real life, it takes longer to make and get an insulin drip ready than to hang a bag of fluids. And usually they're so profoundly dehydrated, we're going to start fixing the problem with fluids first. Um, it really depends on the patient. But we're doing these things all at once in real life. So we would never give you a question that says, hey, fluids or insulin. Now, you may see some on your, you know, HESI Evolve EAQs and stuff like that. And some of them will say insulin needs to go first. Because at the end of the day, yes, insulin is the only thing that's going to fix that patient. But really, um, we want you to focus on fluids first, insulin ASAP, because that's the only thing that's going to be fixing that patient. Um, and so and keep in mind there, it says regular insulin. Keep in mind that regular insulin is the only insulin that can be given IV. Um, we also need to do electrolyte replacement. So when these patients come in, um, insulin and potassium have a opposite or workaround, like kind of like a feedback relationship. Um, so when I have not a lot of insulin, which happens in DKA, um, then what happens is that my potassium is super high. So these patients come in and not only that, like they're dehydrated. So there's a whole lot of particles, not a lot of fluid in their blood. So when I come, uh, when they come in, their potassium is super high. So I want to attach them to an EKG or ECG monitor um, and um, be watching for those changes because um, remember too much potassium is what we do for lethal injection. So I definitely don't want that. Um, so it, it can um, it can be super high. Um, and so once I start giving insulin to treat them though, insulin pushes potassium back into the cell. So after I start giving insulin, then I need to be on the lookout um, for uh, their uh, potassium dropping and it can drop rapidly. So sometimes I'm checking their potassium every two to four hours, like very frequently. Um, and so um, I'm gonna be keeping them on the monitor during that time, watching closely and looking for signs and make sure that they're aware of signs when their potassium is too high or too low. Um, so watching them closely, once their blood sugar gets to less than 250, and then we're going to start D5 half an S. Now, a lot of students find this confusing. They're like, wait, their sugar's too high. Why would you give them something with dextrose in it? Well, we never want their blood sugar to drop too much too quickly. So once it gets less than 250, I'm giving just, it's just a little bit of sugar and uh, mostly fluids for rehydration in order to help to um, like still get their sugar down, but slowly. So um, your, in, your hospital will have a protocol to tell you how to titrate that and stuff like that. So they're just going to be on just a little bit of that, um, to make sure they don't drop too quickly. Now then sodium bicarbonate. A lot of students love this answer because they're like, oh, it's an acidosis. The patient's only in acidosis because they don't have insulin. So once I start fixing the insulin issue and giving that insulin, their pH usually rapidly improves. So we only give sodium bicarb if things are not getting better with the insulin and they're just struggling and cannot catch up with that acid base. This is kind of like, think of it of a, it's not invasive, but it's like the last measure we do. It's not the first thing. I'm not like, grab the sodium bicarb. I'm like, no, grab me my fluids. Let's get the insulin going um, and then uh, managing the rest.
So now let's talk about um, HHS, which you might have seen in the other in the other slide. Let me take a sip real quick. What's called HHNKS, and, you know, and it's the same thing. The only difference there is this HHNKS is like hyperosmolar hypoglycemic non chaotic syndrome, um, where this one's just hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. It's all saying the same thing. Um, hyperosmolar, um, what do you call it? Um, too much, like, what do you call it? Um, not enough fluid, too much water syndrome. And when it has the N NK in it, it's just saying, hey, there's no ketones. So, like, think of it at HHNKS is. Hey, high blood sugar, no ketone syndrome. Um, and that'll help you maybe remember what the difference is here. So this one, um, HHS is much more common in type two diabetics. Now I'll tell you, <coughs> um, out of all my years in the hospital, we see DKA so much more. I've seen HHS a few times. Uh, well, I don't want to say a few times. I see it, I see it occasionally, but it's not half as common as, um, it's a lot easier to go into crisis when you have uh, type 1 diabetes. And you have to think of how this makes sense because in type 1 diabetes, they have uh, no insulin or so little insulin that it doesn't even matter. Um, so it's it, they're going to go into that like acid base imbalance and burning fat so much easier. Whereas in type 2, they still have some insulin. So it's a lot harder to get into that crisis state, um, but it still can happen. But anyway, so this is more common in type 2 and same problem, except there's no acidosis. So there's lots of sugar in the blood. The sugar pulls the water from the cells and the body gets rid of that. So you get this profound dehydration. Um, and then you also have the high blood glucose, like glucose is just not going in the cell. And the causes are very similar, infection or illness, and they're not taking their meds, or if they're newly diagnosed, is how a lot of people come in with type 2 diabetes uh, brand new. So this patient's going to look exactly the same as DKA, except no signs of acidosis. So signs of dehydration, same stuff, dry mucous membranes, increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, and then signs of hyperglycemia. Um, the polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, but also a lot of times these patients can also have a change in their level of consciousness. It's usually more profound because these patients, and we'll talk about on the next slide, usually have a markedly higher blood glucose than they do when they have DKA. Um, and when I'm talking about that, usually their blood glucose is greater than 600. It's super high. I've seen it over a thousand. Um, their blood sugar is so high, they have no energy whatsoever. So they, are, they a lot of times come in kind of like a coma state. Um, and this is why it's called the hyperosmolality syndrome is they have increased serum osmolality. Um, so what that means is, is that there's so many particles, like look, if you look here, like normally there's all these sugars here, but when what happens when there's so many particles, there is no, all the fluids getting dehydrated and pulled out of the body too, there's no room for fluid. So that's what's called an increased serum osmolality. Um, the big, the big uh, important thing to think about with diagnostics here is what is not there in HHS. Because if you see so far, HHS looks just like DKA, except there's no acidosis. So there's going to be no ketones. There's also going to be no Kuzmol's breathing here, um, no acetone breath, because there's no acid issue here. They're not going, they're not at the point where they have to break down fat um, in order to get the energy they need. They just have not enough fluids dehydrated and too much sugar. So when you look at this treatment, it is exactly the same, except the sodium bicarb's not on there. Now, these patients, they have the exact same things. I need to monitor their neurological status, especially since this patient may be more sleepy or drowsy um, and keep their head of bed elevated um, in order to protect their airway and things like that. If they need oxygen, which they may, um, we will give that, but same stuff, fluids, 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 especially because the dehydration is really the problem here. Um, I don't wanna say that, no, I'm gonna take that back. Dehydration is a big problem here. It's not the problem. Still the problem here is their blood sugar is too high. And that's, I mean, cause again, I can give them fluids, but if they have so much sugar in their blood that's leaching all the fluids out of their cells, it's not gonna help. So I have to make sure to give that insulin. So. Fluids first, um, rehydrate them, get their blood pressure up, um, get that insulin started ASAP to get the, that blood sugar down. Um, same thing when their blood sugar gets less than 250, I'll switch to D5 half and S, um, give electrolyte replacement. And um, they may not have as many issues with potassium as the patient with DKA um, does, but they can. 
um, and then watch their ECG or EKG closely to look for those changes. Um, so a lot of students struggle because they're like, wait, I'm not really seeing the difference here. And the, really the only difference is there's no acidosis. Same treatment, same symptoms, except there's no signs of acidosis and I don't need to treat the acidosis. And keep in mind in DKA, I'm not really treating the acidosis, I'm treating the hyperglycemia that's leading to the acidosis. So um, really HHS and DKA are very similar. The only difference is DKA, the blood, like the diagnostic blood sugar that you have is a little bit different. It's down at 250, whereas with HHS, it's 600. Um, and then also the signs of acidosis, the Kuzmol's breathing, acetone breath, ABG shows a pH less than 7.3, whereas with HHS, pH is normal. Um, and then um, sodium bicarb may be needed for a patient that has DKA, where we're not going to use sodium bicarb for HHS because there's no acidosis. And then just that DKA is going to be more common in type 1 diabetics, whereas HHS will be more common in type 2. So I hope this helped. That is the end of intro to diabetes. I will start the next one on a different um, presentation, and this will all be about um, we'll start going into complications of diabetes. So much fun, so exciting, so little time. I'll see you guys for the next one. Hope this was helpful.